Lovely early summer, late spring day. We are pleased to have you here. This is a, uh, you know, obviously we're commemorating now 70 years ago. This would have been around this time that the, uh, the Hungarians moved other Hungarians into, uh, into yellow star houses because they were Jewish. Maybe that is a bit too long. Uh, as, as background, following a mayoral decree on June 16, 1944, over 220,000 Jewish Hungarians who were now also required to wear yellow stars had to move into some 2,000 buildings scattered around the, uh, scattered around the city by June 20th. That really, that's 70 years ago. And you're standing now not at one of the yellow star houses, but at one of the buildings where people came to for hope because they were desperate. Uh, it was out of this building that uh, Karl Lutz, the Swiss vice consul, uh, worked. Worked up, actually, if you look up there where the, uh, balcony, the first balcony is, that would have been where his office, or where his office was on the, uh, the first floor. So people in 1944 were coming to this building because they heard that they could get a document from the Swiss Vice Consul that might help them uh, <laughs> that might help them live safely. In the spot you're standing, then you're, there was, uh, despite the music in the background, despite the uh, the laughter that might have been going on elsewhere, there were people who were desperate, crowding around in some ways. Like you're gathered together now, imagine instead of gathering to, uh, to hear me talk, you were gathering, trying to get into that building, desperate to get a, a document from Carl Lutz. So why this building and why was the Swiss vice consul here? Well, Hungary severed diplomatic relations with the United States on December 11th, 1941, the same day on which the United States declared war on Germany. And as an ally of Nazi Germany, Hungary declared war on the United States two days after that. And the U.S. ambassador to Hungary, Claiborne Pell, closed our legation here on January 16, 1942. So all of the U.S. diplomats left Hungary when we closed our legation because we were in a state of war with Hungary at the time. And when a country closes its, uh, closes, uh, ceases diplomatic relations, leaves, we still have interests here, we still have our own citizens here, we, we need people who will take care of those interests. And so we ask a protecting power, we ask another country <coughs> to uh, look after our interests for us. And that was what, uh, that's what Karl Lutz as the Swiss Vice Consul did, because we had asked uh, the, uh, Switzerland, the government of Switzerland, to serve as our protecting power. A number of other countries also left Hungary at the time and asked uh, Switzerland to serve as their protecting power. So Karl Lutz was not just acting in U.S. interests, in Swiss interests, but also uh, was <coughs> acting on behalf of the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, so Karl Lutz was the Swiss vice consul in Budapest from 1942 until the end of World War II in 1945. And together with diplomats of other neutral countries, because those were the only countries that would have had representation here, the countries that were not at war with, uh, with Hungary, uh, such as uh, other neutral countries, such as the Swedish, who have Raoul Wallenberg here, uh, the Apostolic Nuncio, Angelo Rota, the Italian Giorgio uh, Perlasca, and others, Lutz worked in, the, in that office, as I mentioned, for many months to prevent to try to do something to prevent the deaths of innocent people. He created safe houses by declaring them annexes of the Swiss legation and eventually extended diplomatic immunity to 72 buildings in Budapest, saving as a result more than 62,000 people. Now, he wasn't really authorized to do that. Uh, the Swiss government didn't tell him to do that. The U.S. didn't tell him to issue false passports. Uh, nor did the uh, nor did the British authorize him to do that. He took a, uh, seeing what was happening here. He took that responsibility on himself to see what can I do. 
how do I how do I work this out where I can, with the limited authority I have, find a way to save people who are now being herded into a ghetto, people who are forced to identify themselves by wearing a yellow star, people who are being deported to their deaths uh, to Auschwitz. And while all this was going on, it's June, the Germans had come in in March, within a few months, the countryside had been uh, cleared of its Jewish community, uh, and they, by this time, were almost all dead. Uh, they had been killed in Auschwitz. So it was within this environment that, again, remember the desperation and hope of people who were coming here, and by this time to the glass house, to seek some help from, uh, from Karl Lutz. The music you'd heard in the background before was still playing. I mean, people were still uh, in, in enjoying life out there. Some of the singers, though, were also doing what they could. Kathleen Karadi, uh, Vali Raj, were among singers that we have been listening to earlier who risked their lives to save others. They were among popular singers in the 1930s and 40s uh, who, who, uh, who uh, uh, took uh, Jewish families into their relatively large houses to protect them. And they, like Karl Lutz, they were also recognized as uh, righteous among the Gentiles by Yad Vashem uh, afterwards. But uh, Karl Lutz, like I'd mentioned, while working in this building, issued safe conduct <coughs> documents that enabled about 10,000 10, Hungarian Jewish children to emigrate, and later in 1944 gained permission to issue protective letters for 8,000 Hungarian Jews to emigrate to Palestine. But he used this permission for 8,000 to extend it, to say this was not just 8,000 people, but 8,000 families. Why not? I can extend the number, do what I can with that number. But like I said, it was without the authorization of his government, without the authorization of our government, the United States. And it took a, lot, it took a while for that to be recognized, for this going beyond what you're supposed to do going beyond what your government authorizes you to do, to be recognized as valorous, as heroic. It wasn't until 1958 that the Swiss said that he had done a good thing. Uh, after that, he, he was not able to get the assignments that he looked for uh, because he'd gone beyond his authority, according to the Swiss government. But in 1958, they reevaluated and they rehabilitated him. In 1963, there was a street named after him in Haifa. In 1965, he was the first uh, Swiss national to be named righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. He was decorated with, with the uh, Cross of Honor, Order of Merit by the Federal uh, Republic of Germany, and nominated three times for the Nobel Prize. Now, throughout this, I mentioned that he'd gone beyond his authority. And I have to think myself, uh, having served as a consul at various posts, my most recent post was Syria, but in other places where the dangers were not as acute, but people still come and they ask, how do I get a visa to get out of here? How do I get a document that will help save me? And generally, I have to look to see what am I authorized to do, what's the right thing to do, and hope that my country enables me to do the right thing. And I have to ask myself, and this is a personal question as a, as a government official, asking myself, what would I have done in this circumstance? In, and I know what I've done in other circumstances. I know the, you know the efforts that we made, and I say we because I think we as a government do try to do the right thing now, that we try to make in, in Syria, that we try to, make, uh, to do in other countries where people are able to, to ask for refuge but still, you know, there is a, a decision everyone makes as an individual. Would they do something that they are not authorized to do? Would they go beyond? Would they use a bit of their ingenuity to see how do I right this wrong? How do I speak out and do something which, as a human being, makes a difference, not just as a government? And that's, I think, the, the genius of Karl Lutz. And again, the spirit here around this building uh, as, you, as you gather here now and, and think back 70 years ago what the environment was like. 
So that's, I'd like to, again, welcome you all today. And that's uh, a, a bit about Carl Woods, my experience. We have others here, though, too, who, who have experience to offer. And I'd like to introduce Kati Martin to say a few words. Kati Martin is, in it, is a, uh, who wrote the first book about Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, was uh, and was married to a seasoned diplomat, American diplomat, uh, Richard Holbrook, uh, who was influ who uh, uh, was central in, in trying to find peace between peoples, particularly in the Balkans. And so, with that, thank you, Andre. Uh, good morning, uh, friends, and Andre. Thank you for doing the right thing by hosting this event. Um, it's wonderful to, to be with uh, all of you here on this beautiful, sparkling day in Budapest. My grandparents um, have missed 70 such days. This is where I put on my dark glasses because I get emotional. <laughs> because they were led from their lovely home by Hungarian gendarmes, Csendőrök, to the trains that took them to their death. So I have never even seen a photograph of my grandparents. There was nothing left. And as I have observed over the years how, my ch how important grandparents are to my own children, I feel doubly robbed and pained that I never knew those grandparents whose only crime was that they were born Jews. Genocide is never spontaneous. The world has time to react at each step of the way. Genocide starts with words, words that reduce your fellow citizen to something other, something lesser than yourself. The next step are the laws, the laws that enshrine the words, that then enable the third step, the fatal step, which turns words into acts and into genocide. So the people of Hungary had time each step of the way to react. And tragically, they did not. There was a passivity among the people of Hungary uh, that, that is um, very important to acknowledge. But my own country also must share the blame. Andre talked about personal responsibility. Well, the United States, particularly the State Department, uh, chose not to intervene as Jewish communities were systematically wiped off the European map. We did not intervene. It was a shameful chapter for, for my country. We, we resorted in the last six months when there was only one remaining Jewish community intact in Europe, the Hungarian Jews. We resorted to sending an inexperienced young Swede, a 32-year-old Raoul Wallenberg, who wasn't even a diplomat. He was a fake diplomat. He was trained in architecture. But, but he was a human being, and he was an extremely entrepreneurial human being, and brave, and, and a good actor who could out-Nazi the Nazis. Who could, be, who could take on Eichmann with the same aggression and, and the same certitude uh, that Eichmann was used to from his own superiors. And um, it, it was a bluff that worked. And it proved that individuals can make a difference. And it made a lie out of those who said in Washington and in London that nothing could be done. Because he managed to save hundreds of thousands of Jews just by not obeying the strictures of, of the law, as Carl Lutz did not, and as my husband often did not, because he always placed human values above the laws of his country. Now, Richard Holbrook was not a naive man. He dealt with some of the worst of the worst. I was with him when he was negotiating the end to the Balkan Wars. And believe me, uh, negotiating with Milosevic was, was no picnic. But Richard felt that if the words never again, which we have heard, how many times have we heard never again? And, and, and since never again was first uttered, we have, we have seen Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and now Syria. 
But Richard felt that if those words never again were to have any meaning whatsoever, then those who love life and those who love their fellow man have to be as <coughs> determined, as ruthless, as willing to step on their own government's bureaucracies and, and, and laws as those who hate. And then we have a fair chance. So today, we assume responsibility for people like my grandparents and hundreds of thousands of others by, by being here, by remembering them, and by reminding the country that, did, that failed utterly to look after its own citizens, and I'm talking about the Hungarian government of the day, by reminding that government never again. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Andre, for opening the United States Embassy in a way that, uh, that it wasn't open around the world when Jews were most desperate. But we are here today, and, uh, and it's an important step in making sure that never again really means something. So thank you, and uh, have a good day. There's a lot, a lot to think about with regards to personal responsibility, acting in the way that you think is right. And as we reflect, as we get ready to go to the next house, I'd like to... Uh... These men both from Jesus. When they took the Jews, I stayed quiet because I was not a Jew. As amikor engem vitek el, nem marad senki, akitok tiltak hozhatod volna. And when they took me, there was nobody left to say anything. Never enough to talk about the Holocaust. 
never enough. And when we talk about the Holocaust, we have to talk about its uniqueness. But also, we have to remember Cambodia, Rwanda, Serbia, and Syria. Look at the hypocrisy of the world nowadays regarding what is happening in Syria, but I don't want to go there because it's, uh, I'm an Israeli, so I have maybe vested interest. In no, I have vested interest, in not because I'm an Israeli. Because I'm a human being and I have been there. Luckily for me, not personally, but we were there, so we know our responsibility. So, uh, how can I say, uh, have, a, have a nice day? But let us try to have a nice day. Uh, in spite of uh, the seriousness, uh, seriousness of uh, the place and uh, the occasion. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us. Again.